First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 6. OK, everybody. Welcome back to the new term. I hope you've all had a good break and that you're keen to start on your research project. What I'd like to do this morning is to give you a chance to ask questions about the project. Requirements, ways of approach, how to get help if you need it. Today is informal. It may be already written on paper, but it's nice to have an opportunity to have it confirmed. So, any questions? Dr. Archer, is there a confirmed due date yet to hand it in? Yes. I can now confirm that it's 16th of July, not 15th as first advised. OK? And what about the word limit? Well, there is some flexibility on this, but in general it's eight to 10,000 words. Ah, oh, I see. And you can choose your topic, anything from years two and three. Yes? I still can't work out what I want to do it on. Who, um... In that case, you should see your course tutor to agree on your final topic. And you should also be aware that there is special assistance available at the library on library resources if you need help on that. Can I just check on the deadlines for everything? Certainly. Look, let me write it on the board when each stage should be completed. First of all, you've got to work on your basic project outline, and that's due in to your course tutor by 21st of February, which is only two weeks away, so you need to get cracking on that. Do we have to include a full reference list by then too? No, your reference list is due on 6th of April, which is one week later, so you have time to discuss this with your tutor. And when should we be doing the research? Well, that's over a one-month period, essentially April to May. And the write-up? Well, you need to do quite a bit of research before you get going on your writing, so that's really May to July with a due date for handing in on the 16th. Any more questions? Now listen and answer questions 7 to 10. Well, sir, just some advice, really. It's about the research approach. Would you advise us to use some case studies? Well, Larry, I know these can be difficult to arrange sometimes, but I really feel they are of great benefit in this subject. You can always talk to your tutor if you're having difficulty. Yes? I've looked over some previous research projects that are in the library. Is that a good idea, sir? I heard. OK. I don't think you should go through them in detail, especially at this early stage, or you might end up being influenced by them more than you realise. But yes. It really is about the best guide you can have to what's required in the... to what's expected in this type of project. Sorry, Judy, I butted in on you. That's all right. It's just that I noticed one project was a joint one. They work together as a pair. Is that a good idea? Yes, I remember that paper. Working in a pair can have some advantages. But to be frank, this is meant to be an individual project, so it's best to work on your own. About using subjects, is it OK if we use family members? Your own relatives? I don't see why not. They probably offer some advantages in terms of availability. Although you need to guard against possible effects on your research outcomes. So, you can if you want. Perhaps you should discuss this with your tutor if you plan to use relatives, so you can approach it in the best way. OK, okay thanks. OK, then. Well, I hope we've been able to sort out a few things. You're welcome to see me at any time or drop me a note if you have any more queries. Fine, Fine. Thanks. thanks. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 16. So, what's the survey about, Tom? It's about where students want to live and how they choose. Basically, their accommodation preferences. We've actually tried it out with a few students already. OK, that sounds fine. So, to start with, how many questions have you got? Hmm, 20? Is that too many? Yes, it is, really. People get fed up answering lots of questions and they stop thinking about their answers. Right, so we need to think about that again. What do you think of the first three questions? 
Uh, you want to know what affects students' choice of accommodation when they go to university? Yes. We want to find out which has the most effect the cost, the number of rooms in the house or flat, or the distance from campus. And then we asked another question. Oh, yes. What else did you want to find out? Well, we wondered whether public transport was important. You know, not many students have cars, so it might be quite important for them to be near somewhere where they could catch a bus or train. Yeah, that's a good question. Before you ask any more people, I've got a couple of suggestions for improving the questionnaire. First of all, I think you need to ask fewer questions. As I said, 20 is really too many. I'd cut it down to 10 if I were you. OK, 10 questions only. And is there anything else you think we should do? Well, yes. Some of the questions are actually quite complicated. I think you should make them clearer. I mean, I think they should be easier to understand. And what do you think about asking more questions about cost? No, I don't think you need any more about cost. But you could ask a couple more questions about the reasons for students' decisions. So we should ask some more questions with why? Yes, I think you'd get quite a lot more information if you did that. Thank you. Now listen and answer questions 17 to 20. Um, we've already got some results from our first questionnaire. Do you think we could use them? I don't see why not. What have you found out so far? Well, the number of rooms was only important for 16% of the people we asked. It looks like a lot of students are quite happy to share a room. And even fewer people were concerned about being near a bus stop. Uh, only 10%, in fact. I'm surprised about that. But what about the distance from the university? Well, that was quite important. Around 20% of the students we asked wanted to be close to campus. Hmm, that makes sense. And what about the cost? <laughs> yeah, as we expected, the cost was by far the most important factor. More than half the students were concerned with the cost, 54% to be exact. Only 54%? I thought it would be closer to 80%. You have 30 seconds to look at questions 21 to 27. Hey Jess, glad you could make it. We've got a lot to discuss. Hi Matt. Yes, sorry I'm a bit late. I did bring all my notes with me. Yes, me too. Where shall we start? Well, I think it would be a good idea to clarify our objectives just one more time. Yes, good idea. Okay, here we are. We need to record, photograph and identify the plant species in 10 one square meter plots. Does it say anything about where these plots should be and how they should be laid out? Ah, here it is. It says that all the plots need to be no more than 10 metres apart. And how do we choose them? Ah, this is the fun part. I remember this. Here we are. Make a one metre square frame using bamboo sticks available from the department stores. Yes, we've, we've already done that. I know, I'm just reading the whole section. Okay. One person stands roughly in the middle of the chosen area and throws the frame. The other person uses a tape to mark out the square where the frame landed and returns frame to thrower. The thrower then turns a few degrees on the spot and throws again. The thrower must turn slightly after each throw and vary the force of the throw until after the tenth throw they are pointing in almost the same direction as the first. That sounds a bit complicated. That's only because it's all in writing. It's just a simple throw, turn, throw, turn, throw, turn, until we have ten squares. And I guess you want to do the throwing. Well, if you don't mind. I'm sure you'll be more accurate at marking the squares. Yes, I am sure I am, and I'm sure you've got a stronger throwing arm.
You now have 30 seconds to look at questions 28 to 30. Okay, good. We've got that sorted. Now we need to decide where to go. Yes, I've been thinking about that and I've brought the map. Ah, well done. I forgot mine. Now, I've identified three possible locations, but they've all got some disadvantages. Okay, fire away. Well, the area around this lowland marsh could be interesting. There'll be a lot of interesting water plants here. Looks good, but what's the problem? Mainly that it's already a designated nature reserve, and I think there's already been a lot of research done here. Ah, I see. Well, I'd rather do something that's new and can be useful. I agree. That's why I identified this area further west. See, here, behind the beach. Oh yes, I see. That area there, where it's flat, but quite high. Exactly. If you look a bit further inland, you'll see that there are hills which will protect that area from strong north winds. I see. Excellent. But what's the problem? Just that it may not be very interesting. We know that the geology there is not conducive to a wide variety of plants. Mm, I agree. So what's your last idea? Well, I think this one is a bit of a winner, although I did want to show you the other two. Look up here on the north coast. Where? See, this bay? Well, I know that there's been quite a lot of studies done here, but a bit further to the east, behind this headland. No one has ever looked at that. Well, I certainly couldn't see any studies. That is interesting. And the plant life could be a bit different because of the shelter from the wind the headland provides. Exactly. Brilliant, Jessica. That's a great idea. We'll go there. Thanks. Now all we have to decide is when is a good time. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. Today, I'd like to tell you about how UK architects are playing their part to address the issue of global warming. You have seen many of these iconic buildings while going about your everyday life, but you may not know how they are affecting your tomorrow. In 2003, construction was completed on the famous Swiss Rebuilding, or more informally called the Gherkin, a true masterpiece commissioned by the law offices of Foster and Partners. This is not the first ambitious endeavour of the firm, they are renowned for their various philanthropic environmental efforts. The Gherkin, with its cutting edge green initiative and sharp design, is gaining recognition as an icon in modern architecture. You can pick it out of the London skyline by its unorthodox cigar shape. While its appearance is the obvious attribute at which to marvel, there is far more to this building than meets the eye. And let's face it, there's a lot about this building that meets the eye. The building helps reduce the city's carbon footprint in a number of ways. Just a quick note, in case you're not familiar with the term carbon footprint, get used to it. It's a buzzword you'll hear relentlessly to talk about reducing emissions. Think of it as the amount of harmful greenhouse gases that are given off into the environment by a single person, organization or product. So going back to the Gherking building, perhaps the most obvious as well as the most significant eco-friendly feature is the glass windows, which allow light to pass through the building, both reducing heating costs and brightening up the workspace. The ingenuity behind the various eco-friendly aspects of the Gherkin has seen its fair share of publicity both from serious and silly sources. In a recent April Fool's Day edition, 
One e-publication printed a story detailing plans to replace 50% of the current exterior with grass, which would not only make large steps in the name of sustainability, but also give the building the green hue that would truly earn it the nickname of the gherkin. The only drawback is, as you may have guessed, that this story was an April Fool's Day joke and completely made up. In all seriousness though, the building is setting a new standard of design that other architects and city planners just cannot ignore. The building's bold and cost-efficient design has won a number of architecture awards, including the Stirling Prize, the London Region Award, and the Empress Skyscraper Award, among others. The design comfortably accommodates a large number of offices, while keeping maintenance and operation costs down, striking a superb balance between nature and the workplace. Nature is well and good, as long as the weather is nice outside. Given London's notoriously bad weather, the architects knew they must devise a quality temperature regulation system, and that they did. A special system designed to reduce the building's reliance on air conditioning was devised that cuts consumption in half compared to standard office buildings. There are atria that link each floor vertically to one another, forming spiralling spaces of the entire building. They serve not just as social common spaces, but also act as the building's lungs, distributing clean air from the opening panels in the facade through the entire building. The building isn't all business though. It has its fair share of fun as well. At the very top, a club room offers a picturesque entertainment spot for company functions, private parties, etc., with a breathtaking panoramic view of the city. The creation of such an innovative structure has many wondering what the future of urban planning and architecture may be. Well, if the other projects currently commissioned by Foster & Partners are any indication, the entire city constructed with similarly eco-friendly buildings is not far in the distance. The Mazda City development aims to create a desert city that produces zero waste and removes as much carbon dioxide from the atmosphere as it puts in, a huge feat in protecting our Earth. The Gherkin is a truly impressive feat, yet it is not the only one worth noting. Now to move on to another green initiative, I'll tell you about the Eden Foundation building found in Cornwall. You now have half a minute to check your answers.